blend 43 is just not the same. Roll intro. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. <laughs> yes! Box me around the ears because being a smart ass. <laughs> Do this. All right. So, how long did we do last time? Thirty minutes. No, um, that was, that was a, I don't know where I'm looking. Minutes. I'm looking at here. Too many cameras. Look at this one. Okay. Um, Fifteen minutes was the last one. I think and so. We yep. had a call for thirty, but I don't know about thirty. We're really not very prepared. For I this. remember my first day being a YouTuber. Right. Twenty. Start. Go. Question right. one. How did you get into filming your adventure? For instance, episode one starts at the very beginning, leaving Australia. How did you want to be vloggers? Did you want to be vloggers? How did that come? Thank you for the awesome question, Philippe. We never really expected much to come of it, but we knew that yeah. we were going. It would, be, it would be a terrible shame to go on an adventure like this and not record any of it. So we just sort of had the phone and we had a, a, a digital camera that we already had. And we're like, well, oh, and a GoPro that we already had. We're like, let's just shoot it all, see what happens. Yeah. And we never really did anything with that until six um, months later when we went back yeah. to Australia for um, his sister's wedding. And we were finally like, we had the data, we had the time, mm. and so we kind of put stuff together then. Do you remember before we left Puerto Rico to go back for the wedding? We met that guy, um, the oh, Swedish yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gustav. Yeah, I think so. Um, we met this guy, uh, and his channel was called Ocean About, Ocean, Ocean Around. Around, Ocean Around, I think it was. Um, and he had this beautiful little boat, and he'd crossed the Atlantic twice. He's a really cool guy, and uh, and he was. Yeah, making a, he was making it work and doing it, and we just got to chatting. We had drinks one yeah. night with the whole crew there. It's uh, Marina Pisca the Pescadaria. The Pescadaria. Shout out to them. Um, and yeah, we were just wrapped. We were like on the way to to Australia on the plane. We we're like, could we do that? Can we do this? Yeah, Can we do yeah. this? Should we do something with this footage? Anyway, so we yeah we smashed yeah. out like six episodes in in the the two weeks that we were home, and uh, we just threw it all up against the wall yeah. and then it just took off on us and, and the rest is history I guess. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Oops, question two. Um, so this question comes off the back of a post uh, I shared about an article that we were in written by a friend of ours, Erin, uh, in Sailing Magazine. I'll put the link to that article below in case anyone's curious but essentially the article was um, about how people survive out here, how they how they began, how they got out here, and how they're making it work whilst they're out here. And uh, Robert Virgo, uh, sorry, Robert Vigo, uh, replied to that. Thanks for sharing, but it still doesn't answer my problem. I'm ex Navy, but never under uh, never under sail before, and I don't know anybody. Where can I find somebody willing to take out a noob without costing a fortune? This lifestyle is interesting to me, but I don't um, want to lose the bank finding out. Fair enough, definitely. Fair question. Um, Boats are, you know, you get a big yeah. boat. It's there an expensive are, thing to find out whether you like There's it. always been a very big barrier to entry um, mm -hmm. to sailing. In many ways, it's it's a team sport, it's a close-knit community, and it can seem very clicky from the outside looking in. You know, everyone speaks a funny language and they all dress strangely and they I all... still have not mastered that language. So it can... And, and, and at times it can be a, a, very, a bit of a harsh place and a steep learning curve. Um, so the, the barrier to entry is often quite high but it's also really really hard to find people to come out on a, at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning in the rain and in 30 knots of wind and get washed around with the gunnel rail up their backside leaning over on an S90 S90 racing yacht to, and will show up routinely so if you show some commitment and you just show your face down at the yacht club and put your name on a bulletin board and say, hey, I, I know nothing, yeah. but I can promise you I'll be here every Saturday morning for whatever race you'll have me on, someone will take you. That's how we got Kiara into the sport. We just put something on a notice board. Within a day, we had two responses, yeah. two yeah. responses and an offer on a crew, and we sailed with that crew for the year, um, and we learned a lot from them. So mm. definitely go down to your local yacht club go down to local sailing school, um, just go down there and talk to people and the opportunities yeah. will, people will put you in touch with other people. Yeah. Um, also, you could consider doing, um, there's always crew required around here for passages. Um, you, could, you could get on crewfinder.com. Um, there's other websites like it and just throw your hat in the ring 
for those I would say of maybe having a little bit of experience first would be good, as in like going out on a boat would be good, rather than just kind of signing up as a complete and utter yeah. don't even know what a winch is. Um, you know, you want to bring something to the table if yeah. you're going to be on someone's crew, other than just the watches. So yeah, I hope that helps you, mate. Just honestly go down there, show your face, have a beer with someone. Um, I promise you the opportunities will start to present themselves as you as you seek them out. Uh, so thank you for the question. All right, next question. Ooh. What do you miss the most about dry land? Um, and that was from Josh G. Is that Josh Goodwin? What do you miss the most about you dry land, Mads? You go first. I miss the, uh, like having open spaces where I don't bump into things. I miss that. Uh. And then on the flip side of that, I'm constantly bumping into things, fitting into tall, uh, oh. sorry, fitting into like short bed spaces and things like that. And so for you me, have a it's huge the bed. Space. We have a queen size bed. Yeah, we're next to old mate here. It's just like <laughs> I have a queen size bed. You have <laughs> exactly. yeah, maybe a king single at best. <laughs> um, what do I miss? What do you miss? Hot showers, just non-stop running water. Hot showers. That's With, yeah. That's it. All right. Next question. Next question. That was a quick one. That was, that was good. A good one. All right. All right. Uh, this is a big paragraph. Right. Where's the question? Uh, Kenneth Dow right. says, um, "My wife is such a land lover." Do you have any tips to help convince her to give up her jobs, buy a boat, and sail around this world? Ooh, that's a, that's a. How long we, do we loved have? this question. How it long was do we, so I really good. like this question. We should have. I'm going to name the whole Q and A after this question because <laughs> I feel that it's going to consume the remaining 11 minutes. Oh dear. Um, or the remaining. Okay. How did long. you convince me? All right. Me? How did I convince you? Okay. So, we just dis- we did discuss this before we started because we just go through the questions when you pick them out oh, yeah. and we did kind of have differing opinions yeah we did yeah. but as the only man in the room who successfully oh. got his wife to sell everything and come out go agree I was the person my- <laughs> so I was the one who was convinced you do offer a unique perspective um, alright so I, my answer and it's going to be different than Kiara's would be to make a progressively like sell the sell the sell the sizzle not the sausage first but don't lie to your wife at any point about the realities of the situation so I come up from I think you should show her both ends of the spectrum and then set a goal and that way you're gonna land somewhere in the middle if it wasn't with Kiara and Kiara is very easily convinced uh, I would possibly go if you hadn't done a cruise or any kind of on the water traveling I would just start there that's really easy like it's all top tier stuff you just spend your time exploring the islands going snorkeling seeing turtles drinking cocktails that's the start then from there possibly trickle down to a, a crude charter so you don't have to worry about the technical stuff that you, you know the pressure's not on you um but you're out sailing so you can feel the wind you feel the boat moving yeah you can go where the cruise boats won't and so that's like the next level and you get to see beautiful nice water you sell yeah. the you sell the dream exactly. of the Caribbean. Then I'd probably we evolve. Agree with this. I, that's where we divert. Yeah. Then I'd probably start to float the notion of, can we do this? Can we do this ourselves? But I wouldn't say, at no stage would I say up front, hey, let's sell everything and sail around the world for the rest of our lives. Because that is just such a huge, commitment. huge commitment. And no one's going to, yeah. like, if you hadn't ever considered it, unless you're Kiara, you're probably not going to do that. No, even then, we sold this as like, yeah, like, you're we right, had this you're idea right. of like a gap year, an 18 month thing. If Adam had said, hey, I want to sell everything and just go on a sailboat, it would have been like, well, I'm sorry, I, I have a I career. Have plans, I have yeah. um, other requirements for my travel that aren't on a sailboat. I've never even sailed. How long did, so I, many things. How long did I tell you that it would take? Uh, I think we two said years. a year. A year? A, two years? Yeah, two years. How far have we come in two years? We've just gone down the road. 6,000 uh, <laughs> 6, miles of some 30 to go or something. Yeah. Anyway, so there's my, that's my point, right? Yeah. Is that you, you, you package it up like a sabbatical. You say, let's do a cruising sabbatical. Do you remember yeah. that charter we did, honey? Remember how great that was? What if we did our own cruising sabbatical for a year and then we just sell the boat and, yeah. and it'll be amazing. We can go where we want and yeah. we'll save so much money. and it'll We'll be go the, back home afterwards. We'll be dining out on that story for years. Um, so I'd, I'd float that. And then once you once you get an agreement of that, then you start to like look at the you book the flights, you go looking at boats, you, you start to consider how you might upskill, and then it becomes more of a like one brick at a time kind of thing. And the more bricks you lay in the wall, the more vested you become in the dream. Um, and then I would actually 
do what you say you're going to do um, or, or promised. You take the sabbatical. Like, don't go and buy a half, of, unless you're very wealthy, don't go and buy a $600,000 boat from a boat show mm. and go out there and, and go and get something that's like low risk, that's really an easy sell. And it's like, eh, if it all goes to custard, maybe five, six grand down the toilet, we've got a year's worth of funny stories to dine out on for the rest of our days. Okay, I actually think we agree. Do all we? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my addition to that was going to be, um, if she really does love land, try and give her the best kind of land life as possible. As in like, yeah. if she's hauling jerry cans, if you're constantly in the engine bay trying to fix um, your what engine, does if that it's... Sound like? I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> um, like, maybe try and have like the water maker, like a water maker on the boat. So you can say to her like, yeah, you know, you can have a daily shower, just keep it to like two minutes. So she's not necessarily without, and she's like yeah. acclimatizing a little yeah. more than just like cold turkey. Yeah, I think that's good advice. There, like there's a spectrum. Yeah. There's definitely a comfort spectrum yeah. for cruising. You know, you can just sail from marina to marina and your level of comfort and familiar, like homeliness will be way higher than if you're going from on the hook to on like gunk holing from, from bay to bay where there's just nothing there. Yeah. Um, so I hope that helps. Oh, actually, I wanted to give oh, an yeah, honourable yeah. mention to Charles Brown, who did reply to this comment with a, a good book recommendation. Apparently someone has actually written a book about someone this. Someone wrote a book about this. <laughs> I haven't read it, um, but I, um, I hope you do, because it sounds like it, it's a pretty gleaming Sorry. review. So it's called Get Her On Board, Secrets to Sharing the Cruising Dream by Nick O'Kelly. Uh, so yeah, so check that out. Let us know. Perhaps if it's he has actually, better ideas than mate, us. <laughs> yeah, mate, he might entirely contradict what we've just said, but um, yeah, let us know how that goes, mate. And I hope you pull it off, Kenneth. I really yes. do. Okay, Thank next you for question. The question. Um, oh, this is a good one. This Goulash is also something 75. we've debated over for a little while. Yeah, this is. From this what, could be a whole episode. Yeah, it itself. could be. So yeah, yeah. we'll do our best. From what I've seen, the 50s, 60s, and 70s seem to be the peak of building long keel blue water cruisers. Do you think that there are any medium to large production boats that are true blue water cruisers in your book? Ah, uh, yes, I do. Um, man, this is such a... Okay, I'm going to preface this by saying we haven't looked into it. Obviously, we're not in the market for buying a boat anymore, um, but we do discuss boats a lot. We always go hooning through the bay. Everyone we talk to has a preference on different types of boats. We had a bit of a hunt around this morning. Um, and you know, production boats is a f spectrum, it's a fluid term. These days I would argue that a lot of boats, unless they're built on commission, are production boats, even the, the hot, really nice ones. Um, so I hope you'll allow my loose interpretation of the, the, the word production boat, but we came up with a few candidates that I think tick a few boxes. Oysters, Hylas, Southerlies, uh, Amels, they all seem to, to me, seem to display uh, very sound construction, the design criteria that is sensible, um, medium to high displacement, decent size keel, good sail plan, versatile sail plan, um, sensible cutter or catch usually, or uh, a solent is also pretty good these days, iffy, but yes. Um, good interior layout, they don't have like the tennis court size cockpit in the back that you're just gonna skid across in a and heavy seaway. Skid can rudder? More often than not a skeg hung or a partially skeg hung rudder, although compromises are evident. Like you can see like in the Southerlies, there's a lot of swinging fin keel stuff now, um, which sort of ticks two boxes. You get the shallow draft, but you also get a large, uh, a, 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 a deep draft. So you can track well or point high. Um, and I imagine they're offsetting the ballast with uh, the chain, the, 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 the weight of the chain. Anyway, I digress. What could go on for hours so in answer to your question yes i think there are some there are still production boat companies in a sort of a top tier version of production boats that are still making very well founded very well made blue water boats and i honestly would have one of those one of those boats that we've just listed oyster hylas southerly amel and i'm sure there's others uh, are moody i'm quite a big fan of moody's um yes i think they are still making them they're in a pretty high price bracket these days uh, and they, there have been compromises between what you see in like 80s boats but I don't think that takes them out of contention I just think it's a horses for courses thing and they're evolving to the needs of modern cruising as best they can so yes thank Next you for the question. question I hope that answered your question and if you actually I'd, I'd really love to hear if you have any 
uh, a list of candidates or if anyone has a list of candidates that fit that criteria because you know maybe one day someone will give us a boat yeah <laughs> never sure. gonna happen all right um thank you goulash next question shane real if you were in rough and windy conditions offshore say 40 to 50 knots with the swell that comes with that uh, kind of wind what would you rather be on a higher performance boat for example a j130 or a slower heavy displacement boat like an island packet the risk of waves over the stern and a knockdown are lessened if you're keeping up with the conditions and your ability to outrun and outreach poor conditions is more valuable than being able to lock up and cross your fingers again this is another massive question that we can answer so a whole other a whole episode on this episode one about um do you want to have a go at it we did you did have a very good argument oh, to this one yeah i don't want to talk yeah, too much go on you like All that right. first firstly 40 to 50 knots for this boat for example for us 40 uh 40 knots for us is three reefs and a staysail and keep on trucking the sea state may, the sea state and the duration of those conditions may dictate heaving too that would be my next sort of shift down for a rest uh, 50 knots would probably be just the staysail and more than 50 would be uh, a reefed staysail and we'd really be starting to think about survival survival mode and, and, and safety. Um, not that we wouldn't be thinking about safety <laughs> prior to that. Only at 60 really be, would you be at safety. <laughs> no, we'd really be considering our options quite significantly. So with regards to being able to outrun, I'm not sure that I, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. Um, yes, perhaps if you're in some sort of like hybrid uh, cat that can do 20 knots um, yeah you might have you might actually outrun a storm but most monos including the high performance ones we're talking we're talking what 12 knots on a like a, when you're really hustling if you're really really good let's say 15 let's say 15 we might do six seven eight on a like on average depending on the point of sale a storm more often than not is is quoted at moving at 15 knots so even the top tier stuff like even if you're sailing like dead away from it or across the face with a good range like the chances of outrunning it for a performance mono versus a heavy displacement mono with those differences in speed like let's say eight eight or twelve or six or ten knots of speed it's not enough in it for me to really say like you're going to outrun it and they're not particularly these days with the forecasting the way it is and the what how much connectivity we have like you can you can get a 14 day forecast on an iridium um every hour if you want to um and granted it's not very accurate 14 days out but with that level of foresight even four five six days there's really no excuse for being caught out yes it happens but that's gonna if you get caught out with four five six days notice you're going to get caught out regardless of what boat you're sailing and it's those days that I'll take the heavy displacement boat. And for the, the reason for that is that is that one, I off, I'm a I'm a advocate of of full reaching and heaving too because I like to shorten the time of exposure for the crew and for morale and just generally that's just what I think. I like to be in control. I don't like to run and hold on and 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 try to hang on for grim death and white knuckle driving. Yes, there's a case for that, but as you mentioned, you're running with the conditions, so your apparent wind is less, which then puts the uh, wind vane that you may or may not have in question because it's not going to perform as well. Then that puts your autopilot in jeopardy because your autopilot now has to be able to keep up with the oscillation, so it better be really good. Heaven forbid it gives out. You might now be white knuckle driving short handed for 30 hours or for however long the storm lasts. Um, and yes, if you're in a really high performance boat, you're going to do better at that. But, you know, that's why they have these transatlantic races have the twin rudders because they want to hoon down the face of a wave on course, regardless of the conditions and, and be in complete control. But they have like 12 guys on board. They're not running on autopilot. There's a helmsman there. We don't have that luxury. We're going to be shorthanded. We're going to be terrified. We're going to be tired. We're going to be wet and we're going to be cold. And I do not want to be out there wrestling with a storm for longer than required in the event of a problem and the problems always going to happen on that day um, at night so to answer your question i will i will take a f see kindly forgiving boat over a performance boat any day i think john mentioned this in a, the episode i had with him he and he hit the nail on the head for me he's like you want a boat that's happy that is is a sweet ride at 80 percent and that's 
I, I think you can take that to the bank. That's just really great advice in general. If your boat is happy at 80%, then when it's like maxed out, it's going to be pretty forgiving. You're going to just have, you're not going to be bandied around and knocked over and pushed around. You have plenty of ballast to keep you upright. You, it, it's just safer. I just feel safer. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure I agree with the perform with the outrunning of the storm thing, and because of that, I'll take. I'll take muscle over speed any day when it comes to when you can't outrun something, you might as well be in a brick shit house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, thank you for the question, mate. Um, love to hear some discussion on that. If anyone else has any theories or any discussion, obviously that's just my opinion. I, you know, I'm not an expert. We've never been in more than 43 knots. So yeah, take it, take it as you will. I'm not telling anyone how to manage their storm tactics and from uh, Adzi, I really feel like we've run out of time I hope you, if you made it through all of that um, was that too long we did have some like vote upvotes for more time maybe we'll get some downvotes for too long this time we'll see we'll see what the retention is because you know we're watching we can tell we can tell where you all are like no nah, I didn't want to watch that no nah, I watch that oh I love that oh look Kiara's got a swimsuit on woo peak oh uh, Thank you so much for joining us. And if you have any questions that you're interested in, then pop them below. Yes. Um, On Facebook or Instagram or email yeah. or in the comments yeah. section. Yeah. Anyway, right. guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, if you liked that, then put a like and subscribe as well to us because we're awesome. <laughs> um. <laughs> and modest, apparently. Yes, thank you for watching, everyone. Um, yeah. Thumbs up, subscribe, all that stuff. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.